It's another great hour of broadcasts on News Radio 1040 WHO. The Leaf Guard Gutter System. Get it and forget it. Good morning, friends. Welcome to our Wednesday morning get together. Michaelson here with you. What we're going to do here today is we're going to, of course, be continuing our conversation with uh, various politicians. Yesterday we had Congressman Steve King here and a fellow by the name of uh, Dave Funk. Uh, later, Senator Paul McKinley is going to be joining us here in the studio talking about Iowa politics, perhaps even gubernatorial politics. Uh, we're going to be uh, talking with the Congressman Tom Latham here in just a moment who had a town hall meeting uh, last night, got kind of feisty. Uh, this is how it sounded. Why are you supporting it? On what planet do you spend most of your time? <laughs> Ma'am, trying to have a conversation with you would be like trying to argue with a dining room table. I have no interest in doing it. <laughs> wow. Congressman, I am just a little disappointed in that you'd abuse your constituents like that. I, uh, I don't think that was me, Jan. <laughs> I think uh, it sounded an awful lot like uh, Barney Frank from Massachusetts. Oh, okay. So, it must have been the wrong sound bite. I'm I, sorry. Apparently it was. <laughs> well, well, that's a, it got kind of testy, didn't it? Uh, yeah, it certainly did. I saw some clips out of his uh, town meeting, and, uh, I, you know, if... If anyone in Iowa conducted a town meeting like that and, and talked to their constituents like that, they would be uh, asked to resign the next That's day. That's really kind of a shame, isn't it? Because I, I think we ought to have as much spirited dissent and dissatisfaction here in Iowa as they do in Massachusetts. Well, absolutely. I had two town meetings yesterday, uh, one down at Indianola, one at Winterset. And, uh, you know, people can disagree, but you don't have to be disagreeable about it. And uh, What are you trying to say? Well, that not everybody. Are you, are you implying something? <laughs> what are you talking to me for? Why are you looking at me? <laughs> I mean about That's being, kind of a hostile thing to say, start a conversation. About being disagreeable? You well, yeah, you're just <laughs> implying that there's somebody else here in the room that uh, may, may not share that philosophy. What are you trying to say? Uh, at the town meetings, uh, we have a very, very open uh, discussion, and people uh, interact, and it uh, it really is educational for a lot of folks. And uh, I, I love the discourse that we have, but again, we can do it on a in a reasonable way. People can express their opinions, ask the questions they want, without someone getting personal yeah. or, or demeaning to someone else. Yeah, it's kind of boring, but it's true. <laughs> <laughs> it's what the country is about. <laughs> yeah, we, we should have uh, honest discourse. Don't you? Don't you remember? Don't tread on me. Uh, tip a canoe entirely too. Right. And uh, remember Boston Tea Parties, dumping sure. stuff into the river and all that kind of stuff. Those were the good old days. <laughs> well, I think uh, you know we've seen some tea parties this year. Remember running people out of town in a rail and maybe tarring and feathering them. The good old days, the way Americans used to be back when we had a spine. <laughs> Okay, Jim. <laughs> sure. But I agree. All right. So if we, uh, if we have to be And the I, question was? I don't remember. Okay. <laughs> I lost track. I yield back to balance of your time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, so to, and I have to start. Well, we should start the program now. Okay. Congressman, Congressman Tom Latham is here in the studio with us representing the 4th fourth fourth District, right. that which includes all the way down here in West Des Moines, all the way up to Esterville. Right, yeah. We uh, start uh, in Warren County, Indianola. We've got Madison County, Dallas, and then we go uh, across with Story over to Green, Marshall, all the way up to Minnesota. We've got 200 miles of border with uh, with Minnesota from Esterville over to uh, Alamakee County, clear on the Mississippi. So it's uh, quite an interesting district, and uh, we get a lot of windshield time, I can assure yeah. you. Well, so we talked about the Congressman King about this briefly yesterday. The census people were here uh uh, earlier, and they were talking to us about the 2010 census, uh, and somebody is going to lose their seat in the musical chairs in the reapportionment. Yeah. Who, who do you think it's going to be? Who's well, going to get pushed I, under the bus? You know, uh, we'll see how the districts shake out, but there's no question uh, from everything I've seen that we're going to go from five districts in Iowa to four. Uh, our population in Iowa you know, has grown slightly, but we're not keeping pace with faster growing parts of the country and so in fact uh, we are going to go down to four now how those lines are drawn you know we have the uh, legislative service bureau and independent commission uh, to do the reapportionment the legislature has to approve it uh, and governor sign it but uh, you know so we'll see how the districts shake out 
Uh, but it's going to be, uh, you know, much larger districts for, for a lot of us. Is it going to be kind of a white-knuckle experience for politicians to, to, here in the state of Iowa, wondering how it's, uh, who, who's going to have to run against who, who's going to have to move, who's going to have to go against each other? Well, it'll be interesting, to say the least. Uh, uh, but the, the way the legislature does it, and they look more at their districts than they are concerned about congressional districts. Right. And, and in Iowa, we have to have contiguous counties. They have to be whole counties, uh, you know, that's why, in, you know, in my district today, how it kind of hooks around Polk County, uh, so they're contiguous, but uh, maybe uh, the relationship between maybe uh, Warren County and Ella McKee County, that would entirely right. different issues and things like that. So uh, hopefully there should be some effort to try and have uh, units or districts that uh, have common interests and uh, okay. you know, economic things like that. Well, I would like to get as many people in this conversation as sure. quickly as we can, as, as quickly as we can. And folks, don't be a bit shy about joining us. Congressman Tom Latham represents a pretty good chunk of central Iowa. And if you would like to consider this a town meeting, go ahead and do so. Um, you already heard the way he treats his constituents earlier. <laughs> <laughs> and so be careful because he'll bite your head off. Um, one of my listeners sent me uh, something the, the other day. I asked a rhetorical question on the air. Uh, you know, just a generation ago, it didn't require vast intervention as either the taxpayers or even the medical establishment to pay for generic health care. What happened in the, in the, in the, 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 the gap to cause so much out of control spending? And the fellow answered my rhetorical question. Here's, here's the way he uh, answered it. He said, well, your caller talking about, uh, uh, raising eight kids in the 50s and 60s, the cost of health care was never an issue. Then you asked, what happened? Here's what happened. Uh, number one, heart bypass surgery. Two, angioplasty and stents. Number three, MRI and nuclear medicine. Number four, titanium total knee and hip replacement. Number five, private hospital rooms with no wards. Number six, hospital meals ordered off a menu with choice for different ethnic patients. Number seven, cancer treatments that continue for months and even years at tens of thousands of dollars a month. Number eight, lifelong blood pressure and cholesterol medication. Number nine, 27 million people on antidepressants. Uh, number 10, implants for teeth. Number 11, organ transplant with long drug uh, intervention necessary. He's basically saying medical advances have occurred, but along with those advances, huge associated costs. Right. Do you think that's a good assessment? Uh, it's certainly uh, with the medical breakthroughs that we've had, those those new treatments cost a lot more money. People are utilizing health care much more than what they used to. And I think the, uh, uh, you know, treating chronic diseases where we probably didn't, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago. Right. Uh, Back then we had the decency to die when we well, got sick. You know, and so I, I, you know, thinking back, I'm, I'm 61 years old. And uh, when I was a kid, I looked at someone who was 61 years old, and you'd, you know, a neighbor would pass away or something, and say, "Well, that guy lived a good long life." Right. You know? And uh, it, it's entirely different. Our, our life uh, longevity is uh, has gone on, uh, advanced tremendously. We're we're doing a lot better on health care, but it's very very expensive. And one thing too, Jan, that uh, has caused the cost of the health insurance to go up like it has is that we have uh, in Medicare here in Iowa, and we have a lot of counties in my districts, a lot of hospitals that are 70, 80 percent dependent upon Medicare, and that their reimbursement is not enough to pay for the expenses. So what happens is that the private sector insurance now is cost shifting over to make up that deficit. So uh, while we're paying taxes for Medicare, while uh, the government program out there, the private sector is actually having to subsidize the low reimbursement for Medicare. So that's, that's put additional pressure uh, on the private insurance carriers. The stuff that's in the proposed health care reform package, the, 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 the Congress side, the th was it 3,200? Right. Uh, uh, it, have you had a chance to scrutinize most of that? Have you figured out the, the, the good stuff and the bad stuff? Well, uh, we've tried to go through it. What, what, actually, there's three bills in the House. One is the Ways and Means version, which is the funding uh, aspect to pay for it. They're about $239 billion short of actually paying for what the Energy and Commerce Committee bill is, which is uh, H.R. 3200. Uh, Why would that come out of Energy and Commerce? Uh, that, because they're the policy 
committee of? that deals with health care policy. And then there's also the... Oh, uh, no, let's, not, let's park it here for a second. Okay. Uh, so they have put health care under the Commerce Department? Right. Because they are asserting the congressional authority to even do anything about this. They put this under the Commerce Clause? It's under the Energy and Commerce Committee that has to deal with policies affecting businesses in the United States. Okay, because because oftentimes at some of these town hall meetings, uh, people stand up and say, well, there's nothing constitutional about any of this. And, and if I were to slide you the Constitution, as uh, every once in a while I'll do when I'm talking with a politician, where is in the Constitution? Does uh, Congress have any authority to be dealing with any of this at any time, or especially spending other people's money under right. the enumerated powers? Where does the authority come from? And uh, by implication, you're saying that they're using the Commerce Clause. Uh, uh, actually, in the, the uh, uh, Labor Workforce, uh, Education Workforce Committee is where they actually would use that clause in that there are uh, that have jurisdiction over ERISA, which is the large national companies, right. their insurance policies that go uh, interstate. And so that that is where their jurisdiction comes in. And uh, what their version of the bill is a total uh, single-payer government takeover of everything. It would be one and, thing and to say so that we have regulatory power. Right. That would be one thing. Right. But, uh, but they're asserting they have funding authority. Mm -hmm. Where does the uh, Congress get funding authority for health care? Uh, th what they will claim is that it comes under the, uh, the, you know, the Commerce Clause okay. in, in that uh, they have jurisdiction on interstate okay. activities. And, uh, and so that the funding mechanism yeah. would okay. come, obviously comes from ways and means. But okay. what I've been trying to do to answer your original question right. is trying to mesh these three bills together that are very, very different. And, again, there's about a $239 billion shortfall as far as funding, so that would be added to the deficit. Uh, so whether you end up uh, with the... Uh, education workforce version, which is total single payer. If you have the Energy and Commerce Committee version, which has the uh, the public option in it, uh, you know, trying to put those together. And the one interesting thing is they uh, ended the markup. That's when you have amendments to bills in the Energy and Commerce Committee um, the night about two weeks ago, last Friday evening. And uh, but with the idea of going back after we uh, are in session again in September to address about 30 or 40 more amendments. So there, it's a moving target out okay. there as to what actually is going to be uh, included or not included in the, the final version. Um, I need a technical definition here because uh, I was looking at uh, one of the, uh, uh, the provisions in the uh, 3200, and under Section 246, it says, no federal payment for undocumented aliens. It says, nothing in this subtitle shall allow federal payments for affordability credits on behalf of individuals who, individuals who are not lawfully in the uh, president of the United States. Mm -hmm. It says nothing in this subtitle. Now, does that refer to the entire 3200 or just something in that particular section of the 3200? Well, it, it would say any place uh, as far as the health care uh, would be prohibited for people who are undocumented. However, there were amendments offered to actually force verification of that. Of, of that, and okay. those were voted down. So the, they, had, they say, in principle, they are not entitled, but you have no way of knowing if they're yeah, that's here correct. legally. That's correct. So that is good intentions with no teeth. So that's well, if you can't verify, you know, someone's uh, citizenship, actually under Medicaid today, you have to uh, verify that you are a U.S. citizen or you have a birth certificate. Uh, but under this, the amendments that were, were put forth uh -huh. were voted down by the majority. Okay, interesting. Congressman Tom Latham is here. You are welcome to be part of this conversation. Here's how, as we're broadcasting live from the... Iowa State Fair Crystal Studios, 284-1040 or 800-469-4295. Back at a moment. Right back to conversation. My in-studio guest is Congressman Tom Latham. It's uh, an opportunity for you to consider this a town hall meeting. You're going to be doing more of those, too, aren't you, sir? Ah, yes. We've got a schedule this week, next week, and the next, and the week after. And uh, go back to Washington. We're in session again the day after Labor Day. All right. Let's talk to as many people as we can, as quickly as we can, beginning with Jess. Good morning, Jess. Good morning. Hi. Hi. I'm wondering how you guys plan to pay for this health care bill. No matter which version. 
Well, thank you for the question. Thank you. 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 Thank you.